going to illustrate uh, about Parkinson's disease. So let me just start with a very brief introduction of human pluripotent stem cells, which per definition, it can give rise to all cell types in your body. There are two major types of pluripotent stem cells. One is termed embryonic by Jamie Thompson's group. And this remarkable stem cell type was later Muted. produced or similarly, uh, at least in terms of the ability to differentiate by a um, pioneer in Japan, Dr. Sinya Yamanaka, with the reprogramming technology. So what he did is to reprogram somatic cells back into embryonic stem cell-like cells. So this technology uh, won him a Nobel Prize five years later. And this is the, all my presentation today for instance, and screen drugs. So just to refresh your mind of the IPS technology, as I just mentioned, you can start from a healthy donor or a patient, get a somatic cell. It can be a skin cell or blood cells or whatever, and use the different reprogram factors to reprogram into pluripotent stem cells. And at this stage, the iPS cells can be genome added by the novel technologies, for example, like CRISPR and um, same thing on nucleolase, which we will talk about later. And you can do the genome editing, um, for example, to correct a mutation, and then later differentiate them into the desired cell type that maybe can be used to transplant back to the patient as cell replacement therapy candidates and differentiate into differentiated cell types that you can use for model, modeling disease or screening for drugs. So I'm not going to go through the long list of the advantage of pluripotent stem cells or iPS cells, but I just want to give you a couple of examples here why we're using this type of cells for disease modeling and drug screening. So one apparent advantage is that you can actually capture the disease or mutations of human in a stable and a primary cell line. And you can differentiate the cells into multiple cell types, for example, to both neurons and exercise, and that make your screen and test can be done in the same allergic background. So you can also genetic modify them that will allow you to generate isogenic controls. So here is our screening and disease modeling strategy. So what we need is first that we need IPS lines, and in my mind we need a panel of the line. I'm going to give you the examples which lines I think we need. And after you generate the lines, you need to be able to make differentiate cells that you can use it for your disease modeling or screening. And then the next thing to do is really to do the work. You want to model your disease and run the screen you want to run. So a panel of the IPS line, in my mind, is important to include controls. And this means you have the normal healthy control and also isogenic controls. And you will need patient-specific lines for modeling your disease. And also, I think it's important to have reporter lines that is mostly um, applicable for drug screening, especially for high throughput and high content screening. So I'm going to give you an example of each of this group of lines. Let's with that. So here is a flow chart of um, generating and characterizing IPS lines. And this slide shows a um, 
generation and characterization of a integration-free human IPS lines from a healthy donor. In this case, is from a sample of the cord blood samples, which uh, you can isolate the CD34 positive cells. And this is just a um, scheme of the IPAs of the reprogramming and IPAs characterization. So we generally don't do any uh, characterization until we know the um, reprogramming is complete or you have identified um, clones from patisserie reprogrammed clones. And this takes about four to six months because um, we want to pass into the cells to about 15 at the passage. And afterwards, we do the routine tests, for example, like um, test for pluripotency, ability to differentiate, and um, genome stability, and also absence of integration or absence of reprogramming factors. So we have three male and three female of such well-characterized uh, IPS lines that we use as our control. So these are the panel of the qualification tests that we have done. And each line also has many cells in our labs. And we also use this line to make isogenic lines, which I'm going to give you examples of those. The so panel of the line that we want to make is uh, patient-specific line, and in this case, I'm only going to give you examples of um, lines we made from Parkinson's disease patients, and more specifically, these are the lines made from Parkinson's disease patients carry mutations. That means they are familiar Parkinson's disease patients. So there are genes that are associated with Parkinson's disease mutation. I want you to pay specific attention to the gene parking here, also for, called PARC2, which is one of the um, patient-specific line that I'm going to uh, illustrate for disease modeling later. Okay, but these are the lines we have made and all are integration-free and has been well calculated from the slides here, and we have published the paper last year. So if you are interested in reading more details, um, you can go to PubMed or you can just email me. I'll send you a copy of the um, publication. And in addition to the general characterization, like you see from this slide, um, take an extra effort to generate a large data set include whole genome analysis of multiple lines at various stage of dominatic differentiation because I'm working with Parkinson's disease. I'm not going to ask you to remember all these curves and all these dendrograms here, but I just want to make it aware that you know that these data are all available. Okay. So after controls and patient-specific lines, I think it's important also to have isogenic controls. And in this case, I'm going to talk about the uh, knockout lines that we made in genes that associate with different uh, neurodegenerative disease. Again, because of my lab focus on Parkinson's disease, we made many of the lines that are um, associate with Parkinson's disease, as you can see here, but we also made many other lines um, in the domain of uh, neurodegenerative disease, and I'm going to just show you an example of each uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease line here. So we made an APOE knockout, and the strategy here is very simple, you know, you try to uh, make a knockout in one of the earlier axons and you make a frame shift the mutation that you your hope is that you will knock out the genes here. And this specific line we use for the parental line um, in terms of the APOE allele, one is allele 3 and the other is allele 4. And then we made a knockout here. So in this line we don't have allele 3 and allele 4. And those are the um, general characterization we have done with all of our line. And this is after the um, genotyping, of course, we make sure these mutations are be confirmed by sequencing. 
And here are some of the um, extra effort we um, did. For example, we look at the expression at the MRI level in the knockout line. We generate neural stem cells from here, and then you can see the um, down regulation of the APOE allele. And we also did this by uh, whole genome analyze and by microarray in this case. And we are able to make uh, cortical neurons and astrocytes from this line, which um, are the two most relevant type of the cells for marbling Alzheimer's disease. And I'm also going to knock out line we made. This is in parking, um, which I'm going to show you the functional data of this line together with the patient specific, as I mentioned to you previously. Again, all the lines are well characterized and of course has been validated uh, genotype and phenotype. So the next couple of lines I'm going to show you are mostly the reporter lines. And this, again, we use the um, homologous recombination strategy. And in this case, it's not in. Um, we are going to show you the lineage specific and the ubiquitous reporters in safe harbor. So this is the, a reporter that is specifically to um, for the neural, neuron lineage or for neurons specifically. And in this case, you can see we have a dual reporter in now look and hair attack that we try to um, target at the endogenous MAP2 allele or MAP2 gene is expressed specifically in neurons. And you can see the construct here. And in this specific case, we use think finger nucleolase. You can use CRISPR and Tevin as your choice. And upon homologous recombination, doing the knock-in and validated by PCR, sudden blood, and sequencing, which we make sure is only one allele get the knock-in here. And then we differentiate this line into neural stem cells. And then further from there, we make neurons. As you can see, once the cells differentiate into neurons, this is the luciferase that say to measure the activity of look here. And you can see the uh, increased luciferase activity as the cells become neurons, which indicate the um, reporter is refracted the expression of the MAP2 genes here. To confirm 100% that it is really captured the expression of the MAP2 gene, so we also use the second reporter here, the HelloTag here, which you can use a ligand to um, put into your cell culture and then look at the uh, specific expression of HelloTag. That in this case you can see is 100% co-localized with the um, MAP gene's expression. And similarly, we made a side reporter, and in this case, we target the GFAP endogenous genes. And again, we have done all the genotyping and functional validating, and you actually can see the astrocyte here. You get a much higher luciferase activity. That's because the endogenous promoter of GFAP is a very strong promoter. And then here is the confirmation of um, co-localization of GFAP and the halotype. We also have a, a neural stem cell reporter and an oligo reporter in uh, uh, MVP, which I haven't shown you the data here, but the line is um, available. So the last couple of examples I'm going to show you about the reporter is a, a ubiquitous reporter in Safe Harbor. So this is a general strategy we want to uh, use the um, reporters in Safe Harbor. This is more for preclinic studies. And so you have a reporter that, for example, is labeled with GAP that you can do your in vivo studies uh, much easier to identify the cells that you transplant. Um, in this case, we target the chromosome 19 AAVA site here. And again, you can see the design here that you target one allele, one copy, and in this case, use the CAG promoter um, driving um, the COP GAP here, that you can see every single cell's 10 screen. So the reason I want to show you this one is not only for 
a ubiquitous reporters here is because of the design here that we have designed can make it easier if you want to make a lineage specific report of your own. So example, if you have a well characterized promoter that you want to do even this in another lineage, uh, let's say cardiomyocyte or other lineage you're working with. So in this case, we have the log P side here, depend on the, uh, not exactly the log P, but in this case is the log side that will make a pre-mediate recombination to swap the genes or the cassette here. So we have a, again, because of my work focus on the neurospace, we use a um, promoter that is the term double coating, which is expressed in newborn neurons, and use it to drive a GAP. Um, this case is a TAC GAP here. And then do the swap here. As you can see here, you get a line that you now know is in a safe harbor. You will always target at the same position, okay? And it's a safe harbor and one copy. So this is before the um, recombinase that you have seen the gene or uh, the cells here um, are all green because the GAP is driven by a ubiquitous reporter. And after the recombination um, that you can see the cells are not green. That is because the double coating promoter in this case and um, driving the GAP is only expressed in neurons, not in undifferentiated cells. But as you differentiate the cells into neurons, this is a mixed culture just to make it uh, easier for you to see when the cells randomly or directly to differentiate into neurons, you can see the expression of GAP. And then just to make sure they are from double coating, we run the staining of double coating that you can see the yellow cells here. Okay, so this is an a master cell line, the so-called one, that you can use it to make your own lineage-specific reporter in an easier manner, and we tar target the safe harbor. We have the same line in another sub safe harbor that is on chromosome 13, but here is what we I'm going to show you today. So now we have uh, show you that we can make a panel of IPS lines which include controls and isogenic controls as well as uh, uh, knocking reporters, lineage specific or ubiquitous. And now I want to show you how we can generate differentiate neuron cell types for screening. Okay, so I'm going to show you a strategy that we make neural stem cells as an intermediate stage that can be subsequently differentiated into neurons as a size and oligodendro size. So this is the illustration of our differentiation protocol. You have IPA cells take about two weeks to get into neural stem cells. Our neural stem cells express SOX1, that is the earlier neuroepithelial markers uniformly here. And then you can make neurons as a size and oligodendro size from this uh, neural stem cell population. So I have worked uh, with embryonic stem cells for now more than 15 years. And in the past the 10 years, of course, with the IPA cells, we have made more than 100 lines and of neural stem cells from either EA cells or IPA cells. And it has been very consistent in our hand. And we have published many, many papers. And this is one of the earlier citations of the um, uh, IPA cells that we use this muscle to make neural stem cells. So the next uh, step is to show you some of the characterizations of our neurons and astrocyte data. Okay. In to the routine staining of neuron markers, and in this case is a, a population of cortical neurons that you can see the um, MAP2 expression and the GABA expression here. We also run all our samples with whole genome profiling um, data, and we look at the um, uh, for about 40,000 genes expression one time, and we use the Illumina array platform. And 
based on our data and many of the literatures we have searched, we have come up with a approximately 20 markers that we think are specifically expressed in either neurons or exercise. So here is just a panel of those um, genes that we look and by microarray that you can see this panel of genes which we defined as uh, neuron specific markers that is highly expressed in neurons which are either not expressed or done expressed in um, exercise uh, neural stem cells that again is uh, isogenic derived from the same population. So in addition to a biochemical uh, analyze of the uh, neurons, we have also done a lot of um, functional characterizations including uh, electrophysiology recordings. And this is one of the experiments we did on the uh, MEP play. What you can see here, here is a population of neurons that has been seated on this MEA plate for almost three months here. You can see the electrodes here and you can do it with many lines depending on how you want to see them and then in one of this test experiment we use four different lines and then with different densities and then you can look at the mean firings here. And here is a representative row voltage date and the spike wave forms on a single electrode here. Just for example, like a single electrode. This is a day 49. And you can also look at the um, raster plot, you know, showing activities across all electrodes. In this case, we have 64 here. And then, for example, this is line, line 2 here and day 49. So the take-home message is really, you know, you can grow neurons um, in prolonged cultures and then you can do the recording as the neurons mature, okay? And I have more data of this. I'm happy to discuss details. I know people have problems like how to see the cells and how to keep them healthy to enough or long enough to do your recording. So the other example I'm going to show you is the traditional patch clamping recording of, and in this case is specifically dopaminergic neurons. And this is again is a culture that we um, generate from the neural stem cells after 28 days, four weeks of differentiation with a dopa kit here. That's how the cells look like. And this is the action potential. Just, you know, you do the patch clamping here. Um, I am not going to show you a lot of these data, but I just want to mention, you know, the general recording um, we have done with this our collaborator. So this is the voltage clamp, you know, to determine the sodium and um, potential column in each of the neurons. And I can show you different examples, but this is basically uh, what we do with our electrophysiologic characterization. So the next um, cell type I want to talk about, that's the exercise, similar to our neuron cell characterization. Of course, we do the uh, immunostainings, and in this case, we have a more or less pure population of GFAP expression cells, and this takes about five weeks after the neural stem cells. So this is, um, I know five weeks sounds long, but for those who work with exercise, you will appreciate that five weeks after neural stem cells, that's a very short uh, timing. Again, you know, the exercise, we have a panel of the markers, not only just look at the GFAP, but we look at the whole genomal expression. As you can see here, all these markers that we think are exercise specific are highly expressed in exercise whether well, they're not expressed or downregulated in isogenic neural stem cells and neurons here. And we have published all this data in several publications, which you can look up. So one thing I do want to emphasize about our neurons and exercise is that we can use it to do the co-culture experiments, which you can actually use the same or the isogenic cells or from different genetic background 
for monitoring disease, I know this is important. For example, if you are looking at uh, ALAs, you have a ASOD mutation, you may want to look at the mutations effect on astrocyte and on, mo on motor neurons and in co-culture. So just to give you an example, these are the um, co-culture done with the neurons and astrocyte derived from the same line. As you can see, these are the neurons culture alone, and when you culture with astrocyte, you can see the increased formation of synapsin, which you can you can look you can actually quantify this. Okay, so this is uh, I don't think I need to say more. You can see the increase of the synapsin here, and because of our ability to generate reporter lines, I thought to show you one of these cool um, pictures here that you can use either label CAP label the astrocyte or GAP label neurons to do the co-culture that make your life a bit easier if you, or also it will be helpful if you are doing the uh, um, high content images. So again we have um, provided cells for our collaborators and also for um, commercially we will provide the cells for people to use it to do the co-culture experiments and use for their screening purpose and here are a couple of the citations here. And with that, I now want to show you the real screen and the disease modeling, which I'm talking about. Now we have the IPA cells, we know how to make differentiate cells, okay. I'm going to give you an example of disease modeling, just use the um, Parkinson's disease as an example. Um, we're going to look at the mechanism of act action in a familiar PD model. And then for the screening purpose, I'm going to show you a neuroprotective screen with dopaminergic neurons and uh, toxicology assays just with uh, neuron cell types. So let me start with the um, disease modeling in um, with the Parkinson's disease. So remember I show you some of the line we generate and I put this title here is because I think it's important to use a combination of patient-specific lines along with isogenic controls, okay? So here are the five lines we use for the patient-specific line or in more specifically actually from four patients always parking mutations and then a population control. This is age matched control and all are generated by the same method. Okay. And then I'm going to show you the result from the isogenic controls. As I show you, we have the um, wild type cells and then we make the knockout here, which I didn't show you is every single line we made. We also have a monoallelic um, control which in some case, if it's a dominant disease, and maybe it will have some effect, okay? But in this case, I'll list all three lines here. So, to the study, we are actually very lucky. So, what we seen, what we saw is actually the phenotype that we see a decrease in dopaminergic differentiation of all four patient lines here. That's compared to the age matched control here. And we also see the aggregation of alpha synuclear in all the patient lines um, much more significantly compared to the controls here. And this has been verified by Western blot here and also by staining here. But what I am really interested in this study is to look at the parking gene here. Um, we know parking is involved in mitophagy, so we have put a lot of effort in looking at mitochondrial biology. So after many, many tries that we try to look at the copy number, mitochondrial volume, which we basically see no difference in patients and controls in terms of mitochondrial copy number. And also even when we look at the mitochondrial volume, we didn't see any difference. So, which is actually, we have struggled this a lot and we thought we would see some phenotype. But finally, we um, decide to go ahead, look at the specific uh, cell types. And in this case, of course, it's dopaminergic neurons, which you can see the label I can see is a little bit blurred. The red is TH and the um, green is um, 
beta-3 tuberin, and then we use the mitral track to track the mitochondrial here. So what we're seeing here is we do see a phenotype in this case when you look specifically into dopaminergic neurons, you see a reduced mitochondrial volume fractions in all four patient samples, whereas you, this is the control. Okay. At this point, we were very excited about um, using patient-specific cells to model the disease as we see a phenotype. And, but still, you know, it's not 100% sure whether the phenotype is caused by the uh, mutation or it's because of the different genetic background of the patient. So that's when we go with the isogenic controls. Um, what we see here is this is the wild type, the heterozygous and the homozygous. We make you neural know, stem cells and make dopamine ones. We see exactly the same um, phenotype as we see the reduced TH positive cells when you differentiate them into dopaminergic neurons. And we see the um, reduced mitochondrial um, volume fractions when you compare to the um, homozygous to the uh, wild type here. So at this point, we are quite sure that we can, if we are running any mechanism studies, we can use this line to look at the primary screening and then can use the patient cells as a secondary validation. With the slides here, what you see here is this is the um, wild type that you see the mitochondria in soma and neurites here. So without being a specific mitochondrial biologist, I think you can see the apparent difference. This is the healthy mitochondria here. But when you challenge the um, cells with rotenone, so rotenone specifically damage mitochondria, so you can see the mitochondria swirl up here. So what is interesting is that uh, what we see under the uh, electronic microscopy here is when we look at the parking knockout, this is the normal cells knockout without any drug challenge, which you see is very similar to the wild type cells when you put them on the drug. So we are doing more um, functional analysis of this phenomena. And in this context, I want to add we have a pink one knockout. Pink is known to be upstream of parking and recruit parking in the process of mitosis. And we also have a double knockout of parking and pink for this study. So if anyone is interested in modeling disease using iPA cells, we have a complete reset of the uh, isogenic cells in parking along pink alone and pink and parking double knockout. So with this, I'm going to just, you know, give you a brief um, um, example of um, screening as I talk about two types of screening. One is neuroprotective screening with dopamine and the other is neurotoxicologic test. So dopaminergic neurons, back when I was the NIH as a postdoc um, in 2003, we had published a paper to uh, that time with embryonic stem cell derived dopaminergic neurons to um, look at um, neuroprotective effect. And the model we use is one is MPP and the other is rotenol. MPP specifically um, um, kill dopaminergic neurons and rotenol, as you also seen before, it's it kill all type of cells and also dopamine neurons too. And as a positive control, we use GDNA that we know protect uh, um, dopaminergic neurons from MPP induced cell deaths. And in this particular assay, we use the MTT to look at the viability because we do this this in a 96 well format. We don't run staining of each well, but for validating the assay, we use the MTT assay and then we have um, validated with TH screening and which shows actually the MTT assay can represent a specific cell deaths of dopaminergic neurons. And with that, I'm going to just go briefly with the assay 
and the screening itself. Very briefly, we chose, again, this is run in 96 well format. We have limited capacities. And we chose 44 well-known compounds that have all been reported to have neuroprotective effect. And this has been done in either human immortalized cell lines, for example, like SHSY5Y, or in rodent cells, either in vitro and in vivo. Okay. What we found is that only 18 out of the 44 compounds were neuroprotective in human primary dopaminergic neurons. Okay. And I forgot to mention what we use in the model is the MPP and the rotinol model, but we also use two um, lines. One is embryonic stem cell line and the other is the iPS cell line. So this 18 out of 14 compounds were neuroprotective in dopaminergic neurons derived from both EAS and iPS lines. Okay? Although all of these 14 compounds were reportedly uh, were reported that um, they have a protective effect in rodent or cell models, as I just showed you before. So what is more interesting is that the compound that we identify as effective in the primary cell-based model, in this case IPS or ES-derived dopaminergic neurons, are those that has mostly been used in human trials. And here is the list. And uh, you can also read the papers here. We have published it. So these are the 18 protective compounds, which you can see, for example, like vascurin and serogurin and nicotine has all, all, has, uh, all been used for clinic trial. Well, it's, those are the non-protective compounds are kind of like less relevant. And some of the compounds like this, for example, is, um, has been tested in mice. Um, and many of them has not really been tested in human or fail in trials. So the next or the last screen I'm going to talk about is to use the neuron cells for the neurotoxicity screening. Okay, so this is a um, project I work with the um, NIEHS, which I have a grant with them. So basically, this is a collaboration of called the so-called Toxicity 21st Century, okay, Tox21 Library. This is a collaboration between several of the uh, U.S. government agencies, including the NIEHS, uh, which run the National Toxicology Program, and the NCAT, EPA, and FDA. So they have joint efforts to um, try to use iPS-derived cells, if not to replace the um, toxicity studies with animals, but to reduce, okay? So back then in 2014 and 15, um, there were a set of compounds about 80. Today is 97 now. Um, this 80 compounds were selected by these um, different agencies, and then they ask a uh, different institutions to test the toxicities in iPS-derived cells. And in my case, we use this set of compounds to test the toxicities in neurons, neural stem cells, and exercise. Again, this is run by MTTSA in 96 well plate. I don't have to go through the details, but I just want you to know with this assay we've been using we are able to identify differential toxicities in neurons, exercise, and neural stem cells, and the parent iPS lines. So this is just a heat map to um, those are the 80 compounds here, the differentiate, differentiate toxicities in different cell types. To end this, I'm going to tell you one slide that we use our reporter lines. You remember I show you the um, lineage-specific reporter. So 
In this case, um, the MTT assay is, um, for those who have run those assays, you know it takes time. So we want to do the high throughput screening. So what we do here is, we did here is to use this lineage-specific reporter GFAP driving the NAMO look and how attack, if you remember. And we use the luciferase assay, which is much simpler. And in this case, NanoLook is also very sensitive, and you can actually just do it with the media that you can take a few microbits and then, you know, just run your assays immediately. So we chose those compounds that has been tested for toxicity in astrocyte in the MTT assays. We just picked two of them to make sure that the luciferase assay can repeat experiment. So this is what we see exactly. Those compounds that we found are tox toxic to exercise by MTT assay that also we found it is with a similar toxic uh, toxic levels of um, in terms of viability using the luciferase assay which is much simpler. With that I'm going to just summarize what I have talked about we have developed a panel of lines and that include control, which include healthy controls, isogenic controls, and also we have patient-specific lines that I think provide a unique advantage for disease monitoring and drug screening. So we also have established methods of generating neurons and glial cells and using a neurostem cell gateway concept and as I mentioned in my talk, that we have used this strategy to derive um, more than 100 lines of neural stem cells. And we have very consistent results from our methods. So we also show that iPS-derived neurons and glial cells can be used for modeling neurodegenerative disease and again here I only talk about Parkinson's disease. We do have uh, newer data about the Alzheimer's, which I don't have time to go over today. So we also use it for neurotoxicologic and neuroprotective screenings. And even if it's a small size with the Parkinson's disease and um, screening, I mentioned 18 out of the 44 compounds, we do think the human neuron cultures may better mimic human neurodegenerative disease. With all this, I just want to give you a list of the um, cell lines and the media and different products. All this are available um, from Apprise themselves. You should contact them um, if you are interested in getting any of the neural exercise and product and associate medias, including to do the co-culture, as well as all the genetic modified lines. So I want to thank my lab here at the Buck Institute um, for people who did the wonderful work and also um, NIEHS, which I work with Ray Tice, um, to come up with the screening for the toxicologic models. And many people at Excel Science who um, generate many of the lines and um, run a lot of tests. Thank you for your attention. Hello? Thank you, Dr. Zhang. Uh, now we will take some questions. 